Brothers and sisters, as I mentioned during our congregational prayer, we're going to be talking about worship today. And, and I know that sometimes worship can be a sensitive and delicate and difficult conversation in our context. And truth be told, it has been a difficult and delicate conversation in lots of church faithful contexts for thousands of years. This morning, we are going to dive into Psalm 147, verses 12 to 20, and then we are going to talk a little bit about what it means to praise our God, what it means to worship Him. And so I would invite you uh, to turn with me to Psalm 100 and, excuse me, 147, um, verses 12 to 20. In it, we read these words. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. For he strengthens the bars of your gates. He blesses your children within you. He grants peace within your borders. He fills you with the finest of wheat. He sends out his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters frost like ashes. He hurls down hail like crumbs. Who can stand before his cold? He sends out his word and melts them. He makes the wind blow and the waters flow. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and ordinances to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know his ordinances. Praise the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, this passage is very interesting for a number of reasons. I was just uh, reading through um, some of the posts from fellow pastors on our uh, pastor's Facebook group. And one of the pastors there who was working on this passage and reading through it and studying it uh, realized and, and pointed out to the rest of us that in this passage, three times the word of God is mentioned. Now, I don't know whether God intended that. I suspect probably he did, but um, it connects with Jesus as the word of God. And we know that from the gospel of John, Jesus is the living word of God. And so we see this beautiful and wonderful connection before the incarnation, before Jesus was born as a little baby in Bethlehem so long ago, even longer before that, we see this connection for God sending out his word and declaring his word to Jacob. It is good. God's word runs swiftly. But also in this, we read about the psalmist, or we read the psalmist encouraging us to praise the Lord, O Jerusalem, praise your God, O Zion. Now, you notice if you are looking at an English translation of this along with me, you will notice that those first two phrases in verse uh, 12 are, are given with exclamation marks behind them, at least in most of the translations I am familiar with. And if your translation does not have that, you can turn back to Psalm 147, the beginning of Psalm 147, where it says, how good it is to sing praises to our God, how pleasant and fitting to praise him. And, and, 
and there you will find probably an exclamation mark. Now, now exclamation marks did not exist in ancient Hebrew. Uh, in fact, they had no punctuation at all in ancient Hebrew, the written form of it, that is. And, and so uh, this is the translators trying to capture the, the exuberance and intensity of the, the command here to praise the Lord. And, and that makes a lot of sense because throughout the scriptures, we see time and time again a call to worship God and praise him wholeheartedly and enthusiastically. And we also th see throughout scriptures examples of people doing that. Remember, for example, David, who was the king of Israel and who danced and praised God so exuberantly that he was almost naked in the streets doing so. But that is something that sometimes we find a little bit difficult to do. I don't know, maybe for us it is part of our Northern European cultural heritage that makes us uh, appear more stoic than perhaps uh, David in his Mediterranean uh, cultural background and his enthusiasm. Uh, who knows what it is? And this is where this message becomes perhaps a little bit delicate for us. You see, how we worship in terms of the outward expression of that worship is not really the key thing here in this message although it could appear to be. And so I'm going to ask you to bear with me, to bear with God as God speaks, Lord willing, through me to share with you some of what God is speaking about in worship and not to assume that I am commanding you to act exuberantly in your worship. Instead, really seek to hear what God may be saying to you about how you worship. Before we dive too far into that, we want to look at a few other things, however. One of the things we want to look at is we want to look at uh, the Bible, we want to look at John. We want to look at the Gospel of John, verses or chapter four, verses twenty-three to twenty-four. And, and this is when Jesus is speaking with his disciples, and he says to them, "The hour is coming, and is now here, when true worshipers, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth." For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And this gets to the heart of the matter. No matter how you worship, whether it is praising God through songs and raising your hands or, or speaking in tongues or prophesying, or whether it is helping the poor, whether it is uh, guiding the lonely to Christ, whatever it is, your act of worship, it should be done in truth in spirit and in truth. That is absolutely essential. There was a time, and I'm sure it is still the case, for lots of people where 
there was this idea that we needed to paste on a, a, a smile. It was almost like you need to fake it till you make it. You need to you need to pretend to be super happy because that's what worship looks like. <laughs> but that is not necessarily what worship looks like, and it is certainly not true that we ought to fake it. That is not okay. It is important that we are honest in our worship. But it is also important in that honesty to ask ourselves whether we are really, truly worshiping our God in spirit and in truth. Are we honest with ourselves? Have we really understood who God is and who we are and how much worship, wholehearted worship, he deserves. The Shorter Catechism, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, which is a Reformed Catechism, it's, it's not one that is officially part of our documents that we hold to, but nonetheless, it is really important, and it is a Reformed Catechism, their first question and answer is, what is the chief end of man? In other words, what is our purpose? Why are we here? And the answer for that found in uh, throughout the scriptures that they articulate in the Westminster Shorter Catechism is man's or humanity's chief goal, chief purpose, chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And where, where do they get that? This idea that our purpose is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Well, they get that from a number of different places. Listen to some of these passages. Psalm 86, verse 9. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. Or Isaiah chapter 60, verse 21, Thy people also shall be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. God is commanding his people to glorify him. Romans chapter 11, verse 36 says, for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Everything should point to God to give him glory. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 10, 20 says, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. They belong to God. Everything we have and are belongs to God, and we are called to glorify God. Chapter 10, verse 31 says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. We are called to do everything we do as an act of worship to God. And not just any act of worship to God, not some fake going through the motions worship of God, but genuine worship of God. Remember the enthusiasm with which David danced in the street before the ark of the Lord and worshiped God. 
Remember that when Jesus entered into Jerusalem on the triumphal entry, and, and the Pharisees and the religious leaders told him to silence the crowds, he said that unless they, unless they speak up, God would raise up the very rocks to praise God. And forgive me for paraphrasing there. It is good to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him says Psalm 147, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, worshiping God is what we do. It, wa it is what we were made to do. It is what we were meant to do. And so it begs the question, why do some of us many of us, me included, feel so constrained in how we worship. Not only do we, do we feel constrained in how we worship in terms of our congregational setting, or maybe there you, you there at home are feeling constrained in that, but we also feel constrained in terms of how we worship in public. Our acts of worship, of helping the needy, of speaking about our faith, about going out of our way to do what God calls us to do. All of these things, we, we have boxes around us that hem us in. Here is one reason, I think, that we maybe feel constrained. Well, two reasons. One is that, that there are a lot of traditions in our denomination, in our cultural background, in the way we think and feel about things that, that do provide constraint. We even read in the scriptures about how everything ought to be done in decent and good order, which is true, but then we misapply that to certain types of worship expression to make us think that those are invalid or unorderly or inappropriate. But the scriptures never say that. The scriptures do not tell us not to speak in tongues in worship at all. No, instead, the scriptures tell us to do so in a way that serves the community and in a way that honors God while not disrupting everything. And so there are, there are guidelines for how one is to speak in tongues in a worship service, not a prohibition against speaking in tongues. The same is true for many acts of worship that we might experience in a worship service. Raising our hands clapping, praising God, making a joyful noise unto the Lord. Those are all legitimate biblical examples of worship expressions that may occur in a worship service. Symbols and liars and uh, liars being instruments, not people who are telling lies, right? All of these things are good. But yet our tradition is one where those things are at the very least uncomfortable for some of us. And for some of us, we have it stuck in our heads and in our hearts that they're not okay even, that they are wrong. That is not true. That is not true. But not only that, we also have 
built within us because of the fall, because of sin, we have a tendency to not to want to look foolish. We desperately do not want to look foolish. This was one of the very things that David was accused of when he was dancing, that he was looking foolish. But brothers and sisters, let me tell you something very important about acting. (laughs) Acting like as in the theater or movies or whatever. The only way that you ultimately look foolish as an actor, is by not committing fully and wholeheartedly to the role you are called to play. The only way you ultimately look foolish as an actor is by not committing fully to the role that you are called to play. So, for example, if I am going to be a bad guy in a movie, I need to buy into that and go all the way on acting that. And if I am constantly worrying about how I might look foolish in my mind or in my heart, if I restrain my actions, my motions, my words, because I don't want to look foolish, then that is the way that I will ensure that I do look foolish. But if I go all in and embrace pretending that I am the villain, that is when you can get magical performances. This is true also of singing as well or other musical endeavors. If you go all in and abandonly sing, you have much more likelihood of not sounding foolish than if you restrain your voice, if you hold it in, if you try to control it and not look foolish to people, if you're thinking in your head and heart about how you're afraid that you're going to be off key or whatever, then you probably will be. You need to go all in and not worry about it. And this is true for sporting endeavors too. An athlete who restrains himself in the moment of competition is not going to succeed. An athlete who is worried about how he will look in front of the cameras or the crowds or whatever, not going to last, not going to be great. An athlete who plays her game with abandon She will be amazing. And yet with our worship, we are afraid of looking foolish to our neighbors in our pews. We are afraid in our acts of worship wherein we tell people about our faith, we are afraid that we will look foolish foolish to our co-workers, or we will look foolish to our friends and neighbors. We restrain ourselves. Don't get carried away, Dan. Don't get too enthusiastic. You'll scare them off. You'll look like a fool. They'll make fun of you. I couldn't share that with them. That's too private, too personal. I'm afraid of what they will think. And so, brothers and sisters, 
this message, this call from Psalm 147, it is not for us necessarily to do any particular thing in our worship. But then again, it's not not that. It is rather to examine our hearts and minds and to consider whether or not we are praising the Lord our God with all of the enthusiasm, all the spirit and truth that he deserves from us. Not just in our singing or our worship services, but throughout our whole lives. We're embarking on a new year, brothers and sisters. Let this year be a year in which we seek to praise God in spirit and in truth, to glorify him, to worship him, and enjoy him forever in spirit and in truth, in all that we do, whatever it is we do. Let us be abandoned in our praise of him. And let us say, who cares what others will think? Of me. Instead, let us praise the Lord, for he deserves it. He sends his word, his word speeds along, his word, his word has been revealed to us. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so very, very much that we were created to glorify you and to enjoy you. Father, may we do so this year with arms high and hearts abandoned, whether that is metaphorically or literally or both, O God, May we praise you with our whole hearts and our whole minds and our whole souls, every part of our being. May we praise you forever. Help us, O God, not to be constrained by worries about what others may think or our traditions which hamper us, but instead may we worship truly and fully. You, God, who deserve it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.